All right, you thought that was fun. So this is, this is what I think is going to be more fun. Now, let's cover hermeneutics again, shall we? So I always enjoy hermeneutics. I don't know about you, but I enjoy doing that. It becomes more enlightening with the scriptures. So as we cover the book of Revelation, chapter 2 and chapter 3, the question is this. The question is, is he speaking to Christians in chapter 2 and 3, or is he speaking to tribulation saints? You might say, why do you say that, Pastor? Because the reason why we suppose Christians is because of chapter 2, chapter 3. Notice he's speaking to church, right? So that's why we suppose it's Christian. But why do we think it applies to tribulation saints? Because, remember, in our previous Revelation studies, John says that he's writing as if he's in the tribulation timeline. The book of Revelation itself is about what? The revelation, which is tribulation end times. So Revelation chapter 2, chapter 3, it sounds like he's speaking to tribulation saints. You know what the answer is? Both are true. Now you might say, why is both true? This is why this is going to be fun, okay? So I like talking about this. So here we go. The first thing is this. It, in order to understand this, notice, the Bible, look at Revelation chapter 1, verse 3. Okay, so why do we suppose this to be the church age? Based off of Revelation 1, verse 3. And we're also going to think about this. We're also going to be thinking tribulation doctrine. Here we go. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this what? Prophecy. And keep those things which are written therein. See, the things that are written in this book of Revelation will, re will relate to what? Future prophecy. Now, here's something to understand. If this is referring to a prophetic future sense, it's not really going to make sense that when you see Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, it is only speaking to local churches of that timeline. Okay, what am I talking about? Okay, remember, I told you a threefold application in the book of Revelation, right? All right. Let's review. Historical. Spiritual. Doctrinal. All right, now let's review this. So, historically, John is writing to seven local churches during his time period. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. He is literally writing to those people. Uh, we saw that at Revelation chapter 1. And verse 11, see that? It is a local region in his local area that God wanted John to write. So that's a historical application. The spiritual application, we put that as church. You might say, why? The reason why is because he mentions church right here. So because he mentions church, why can't we spiritually apply that to churches today. You can learn, I mean, do we not take spiritual applications and lessons from chapter 2 and chapter 3? We sure do, especially when we bash Laodicea, right? Yeah, so there's a lot of lessons, spiritual lessons from there. So that's a spiritual application. Doctrinal application is tribulation. You might say, why is it tribulation doctrine? The simple answer is because we already read it uh, at chapter 1 and verse 3, right? But look at chapter 1, verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ. See, he told you what the book was. He didn't say the church age. He said revelation of Jesus Christ. What is the timeline of revelation? That's tribulation. You know what the revelation of Jesus Christ means? When Jesus reveals himself in wrath and anger and conquers the world. That's a tribulation. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must, look at this, shortly come to pass. See, it's future. Here's another one. Look at 
chapter 1, verse 10. That's more evident, chapter 1, verse 10. Notice right there, when John is writing, he says, I was in the Spirit on the what? Lord's Day. Now, we already know what the Lord's Day is, right? We, that's the day of the Lord. That's tribulation. So Revelation already told you that this will be talking about a tribulation time period. So it's tribulation and doctrine. So let me write all this out so that no one gets confused. And it's like I'm losing space. Here we go. Doctrinal is tribulation. Spiritual, we can say the church age, which is Christians. And then historically is literally local churches of that time. Now, as we cover chapter 2 and chapter 3, we believe that it is accurate to put these seven churches, getting back to the church age here, right? We believe this is an accurate representation as a spiritual application, this chart. Not doctrinal, but spiritual. Now, why you might ask me, why can't we put this as doctrine? Because I'm going to show you real... We're going to see this as we go through chapter 2 and chapter 3. There is no doubt there is tribulation doctrine in these verses. And we're going to cover them. So you can't apply them to the church. Now, why can we put this as a spiritual application to the church? I mentioned because of the word church, right? That's one clue. But let's look at other things here, which is going to be very interesting. Now, the question is, okay, we know that this can refer to the church age, but why put it as a future timeline of the whole church age? Why not just say the local churches, right? Which is a fair question. Why do we have to put this as a whole church age? Because look at chapter 1, verse 3. We read that. It contains prophecy. If we say seven local churches, that's not prophecy there. If we're going to put this as a whole prophetic issue, it is more accurate to put all these seven uh, churches within this timeline. And what you're going to find out as we go through each of these churches, there is no doubt it matches with every prophetic timeline. That's what you're going to find out. So if God is speaking to churches here, and he's speaking about a future prophecy, it makes more sense like this. But here's another reason why we don't put it as simply local churches. The reason why we put this as the whole church age is because God is speaking to all Christians of every church age of that era. You might say, really? Yeah, look at uh, one example, chapter 2, verse 7. <clears throat> he that hath an ear... Let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the who? Churches. Notice the first part, he that hath an ear. That's anyone. See, anyone that time, God wants all the churches to hear this. And this was only to Ephesus. If you look at every church, he's going to say, he that hath an ear, let him hear. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says. So obviously God is not thinking, okay, only you seven can hear. The rest of the Christian world don't need to know. No, he wants everyone to know. So it makes more, so think about it. If we're going to think about the whole entire Christian church within a prophetic timeline, this fits the bill right here. This perfectly fits the bill. But the question now is this, how can you put Double application, because remember, we say it's tribulation prophecy, right? But now we're saying it's church age prophecy, too. So the question might be, is that, okay, that doesn't make sense, Pastor. How can you put two things within one prophecy? That doesn't make sense. Uh, that's why people get messed up in wrong doctrine. That's why people don't know much Bible. That's why people apply verses wrongly in Revelation 2 to 3 to Christians where they think they can lose their salvation. That's why some hyper-dispensationalists wrongly say 
that Revelation 2 and 3 is only tribulation saints and not to Christians. No, you got to realize when God is speaking about prophecy, he can be thinking about two different timelines while addressing one group. Really, Pastor? That's why people don't understand general epistles. General epistles, which are the book of Hebrews through the book of Jude, people get confused. Well, they are speaking to the church right here. So the hyper-dispensationalists think this is local assembly at the tribulation. And then the people who are anti-dispensationalists, they say, no, this is to Christian churches only. No, you got to realize Hebrews through Jude, it undoubtedly contains prophetic statements. If you doubt me, then you didn't read. If you read Hebrews through Jude, you can't escape mentions of the Antichrist, uh, end times, in the latter days, false prophet arising. You can't escape that through Hebrews through Jude. So Hebrews through Jude, it contains prophecy as if it's only addressing one person, but it's speaking about two different timelines. Oh, I don't believe in that. I'm glad you said that. Shall we look at the scriptures and have some fun? All right. All right, let's have some fun, shall we? Let's turn to the book of Psalms chapter 22. First, let's look at Psalms 22. And then we're going to look at the book of 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel. And I will believe that's chapter 9. Let me double check. I believe it's 2 Samuel 9. Nope, it will be chapter 7. Chapter 7. So 2 Samuel 7. In Psalms chapter 22. Oh, I don't believe in that, a prophetic statement where he's addressing as if it's one person but two different timelines. No, let's look at the scripture, shall we? Amen. Psalms chapter 22. Now, notice the intro of Psalms 22. It's a psalm of David, right? Is this David speaking? Yes. Now, look at this. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? That's David speaking, right? But guess what? That is a fulfillment of prophecy of Jesus on the cross. Remember that verse, what Jesus said? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Look at this, as if it was only one person, but it's speaking about two different people, two different timelines, although it looks like one person. And this is, Psalms is a book of prophecy. Let me show you a better one, okay? Oh, by the way, before I get to the better one, let's look at the context here. Let's assume verse 1 is only Jesus, okay? No, this is not David. This is only Jesus. Okay, did Jesus do this on the cross? Verse 2. Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not, and the night season, and am not silent. No! Did, Jesus did not cry day and night to God. He didn't do it like that. He did it one cry right here at verse 1. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He didn't go all day long, all night long. Oh, boo-hoo, boo-hoo, like that. He didn't do that. Okay, well, this is David then. No, you can't say it's just David because look at verse 18. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. What's that? That's a fulfillment of prophecy of Jesus where they took his garment and divided it. Now, see, if you have this one-mindedness mentality, that's why they mess up in doctrine. That's why dispensationalism is important. What is dispensationalism? Rightly dividing. you got to divide. You can't have a one-minded concept. If you keep having a one-minded concept, you're going to be like 90, okay, I'm going to say this, 99% of the churches who are wrong. Whoa, that's bad. Now, I'm not saying we're the only right church in the world. If, it, if we are, then you better get out of this church. I'm a cult leader, all right? There are thousands of Bible believers like us. But what I'm saying is if you're going to look at the huge statistics of churches, we're like 1% compared to the 99% of the huge majority of churches out there teaching doctrine. Now, if you don't believe me, then all you have to do, like some onliners did, ask them about this kind of doctrine on dispensationalism, they have no clue what you're talking about. They haven't the foggiest idea. Okay, go to 2 Samuel chapter 7. 2 Samuel 7. 
So it looks like I'm not going to be able to go to the church of Smyrna. So we'll just finish with Ephesus. So look at 2 Samuel 7, because this is important. This will establish everything when we go through chapter 2, chapter 3. You don't want to be a hyper-dispensationalist where they think it's only tribulation doctrine. And you don't want to be like an anti-dispensationalist thinking this is only Christian. No, you have to have a double application. Double, double, double. You're going to hear me quite say that often. Double application. If you don't believe in double application, let me tell you, you don't know Bible. Period. That's not being mean. That's plain truth. That is honest truth. If you read that Bible over and over again, you can't have a one application concept. That does not make sense. An honest Bible reader can't get that. If you want one application, it is possible if you force verses into what you want it to mean to say, rather than letting it say as it wants to say. See, we literally believe every word to be true. We don't go like, well, there's an English dictionary definition for it or a Hebrew or Greek definition. You know, during the history of that time, we can see how it matches up. No, 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 no. You just read the verse as it says. Amen, and trust me, history, semantics, Greek, Hebrew, English, it's going to match even more perfectly. You let the Bible establish first, then all these other sources will follow. If you go by these sources first, you're going to manipulate that verse to how you want it to interpret. <clears throat> San Samuel, chapter 7. Look what God said. Look at verse 14. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. <clears throat> so God is talking about Solomon. God said that I'm going to be a father to him, and he's going to be my son. But guess what? If you look at Hebrews chapter 1, we're not going to turn there, but if you don't believe me, you can look it up. If you look at Hebrews 1, that is a prophecy of Jesus Christ. And if you doubt me, then find another verse somewhere and show it to me. This is a verse, a prophecy concerning Hebrews 1 about Jesus Christ. But look at this. Can you honestly say this is Jesus Christ? Keep reading verse 14. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. Really? That's Jesus Christ? He's going to sin so God punishes him? And chastens him? No! This is Solomon, which is true. Solomon did sin. Notice that this is a prophetic statement of David's son Solomon and a prophetic statement of Jesus Christ. Boom! Double application within one prophecy. Same thing with Psalms 22. Last one. I just want to throw in one more goodie. Look at Daniel 11. <clears throat> Daniel 11. Now, if you read your general epistles and you keep saying, this is only tribulation, this is only tribulation, you're a Bible amateur. And if you keep saying when you read the general epistles, oh, this is only for Christians, this is only for Christians, you're a Bible nitwit. So you got to realize this, is that, why are you saying that, Pastor? Because there are people who hate this teaching of dispensationalism, of double application. So then some of them turn out to be sweatshirt losers who are 60-year-old midgets, and then they all whine, eh, and eh, they can't talk right. And then they'll just try to say, this is for Christian, this is for Christian, and criticize every hardworking, Bible-believing preacher out there, not just me. Those people I don't have an ounce of respect for. Compared to people who are ignorant and who don't really know, I treat them differently. But these people who attack dispensationalism and dispensational salvation, man, I have no respect for you when you attack that. Because this is truth you're attacking. And it is so enlightening, it opens your eyes to many things. <clears throat> Daniel chapter 11. Now look at this. We're going to look at verse 5. And the king of the south shall be strong, and the one of his princes, and he shall be strong above him, and have dominion. His dominion shall be a great dominion. And in the end of years they shall join themselves together, for the king's daughter of the south shall come to the king of the north to make an agreement. But she shall not retain the power of the arm. So notice that Daniel 11 verse 5 through 6 is giving a future prophecy, right? about a king of the south and the king of the north. This prophecy was fulfilled 
during the, B, uh, the latter BCs of Syria and Egypt. That's what you're going to find, find out. There are Antiochuses and the Ptolemies. So you're going to see this fulfilled during that time. But look at this prophetic statement. You can't keep saying this is Antiochuses or the Ptolemies of King of South, King of North. Look how this shifts. Look how this switches. Look at chapter... Mm. Look at chapter, 20, uh, chapter 11, verse 25. And he shall stir up his power and his courage against the king of the south with a great army. And the king of the south shall be stirred up to battle with a very great and mighty army. But he shall not stand, for they shall forecast devices against him. You might think... So that's talking about the latter BCs, right? Ptolemies against the Antiochuses. No, this is tribulation. You might say, how do you know that? How do I know that? Look at verse 21. And in his estate shall stand up a vile person to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. And with the arms of a flood shall they be overflown from before him and shall be broken, yea, also the prince of the covenant, and after the league made with him, he shall work deceitfully. Look at that. If that's not enough, uh, look at uh, chapter 11, verse 38. But in his estate shall he honor the God of forces, and a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things. Now let me ask you this question especially those of you who were really into prophecy and antichrist stuff, you all know that Daniel 11, these verses I read to you, is talking about the antichrist. So notice that these verses, taking it for granted, I'm not going to go all over it, okay? But if you want me to prove it, all you have to do is look at chapter 11, verse 21, 22, and 23, and compare that with Daniel chapter 9, Matthew 24, as well as 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. So I'm doing all this from memory. Just look at those three chapters on those verses, compare it with these passages, and you're going to find out, wow, this is the Antichrist right here. Okay, now taking it for granted, we know that this is the Antichrist. Then notice, then this king of the north, king of the south, it just shifted all of a sudden from the latter BCs to what? The tribulation. So notice two time periods as if he was talking about one group of people here. No, but he's talking about two different groups. The Ptolemy and the Antiochuses versus the Antichrist and uh, the rogue nations that time. Now, the rogue nations, I gave some interesting studies on those. So you just look up those videos on end times and demons and you'll find out. Okay, but see, that's why it makes so much sense right here that in prophecy, there is double application. The easiest evidence is this, two of them. Look at every messianic prophecy at the Old Testament. Look at every prophecy concerning about the destruction of Israel. And it's going to jump from a Babylonian B.C. timeline to a tribulation timeline. Amen. Prophecy, one statement, but two different groups of people jumped at two different timelines. Capiche? Now, if Daniel does this, which, if you doubt me, read all the chapters on Daniel on prophecy, there's a jump in timelines here. You don't think Revelation's going to do that? Especially Revelation is probably the most important book on prophecy, and you're going to make this one application, really. Really, the most important book on prophecy, one application, you, you're going to teach heresy. I'm not just going to say error, you're going to teach plain heresy. If you don't have a mindset of double application, you will teach heresy, period, whether you're a mid-axe hyper-dispensationalist or you're an anti-dispensationalist, Calvinist. All right, let's go back. Revelation 2. All right, that was a lot of fun. I love hermeneutics. 